This set of notes will take you through testing claims. In Schoology, you should find a uh, note sheet that you can fill out while you watch this lecture. So you spent the last two days uh, doing a Pogol that let, sort of led you through some of the experimental design ideas that we're going to be talking about today. Okay. So the other day we talked about claims in science, which we call hypotheses, and those claims need to be tested, right? That's how we acquire evidence to support our claims. So testing a hypothesis requires scientific evidence, and it normally in chemistry comes from experiments. And so what is an experiment? It is a situation set up to observe how something happens or to test a hypothesis. A scientific claim. So if you've used the word claim in other classes, just remember again, all a hypothesis is, is it's a claim in science. Okay, so for example, a question that we might want to answer with an experiment is this question. Does sugar dissolve faster in hot water? Okay, we want to set up a situation to observe how something happens to test the answer to this question. All right, so we might come up with a claim for this that answers this question. Does sugar dissolve faster in hot water? Well, from my experience in my life, I think it probably does. So I am going to make the claim, I think sugar dissolves faster in hot, hotter water. Quick check, is this a scientific claim? Well, if you remember from last week, a scientific claim is one that can be disproven or proven false. So, in other words, can we come up with evidence that would definitively tell us that sugar does not dissolve uh, in faster in hotter water? Yes, we could. So this does meet the, the uh, requirements of a scientific claim. So it is testable, absolutely. All right, so if we are going to test this idea, I think sugar water dissolves faster in hotter water, one possible experiment a person might do would be an experiment that looks like this. Okay, so my question for you, based on what you can see here, is does this support our hypothesis? So take a good look at those three experiments and see what do you think. Well, some people initially might say yes because they go, let's see, hottest was 45 and that only took 35 seconds. Next was 35, and that took 47 seconds, and next was 25, and that took 53 seconds. So yes, sugar dissolves faster in hotter water. However, if you're looking at this closely, you might see that there is a problem. And that problem is that not only did we change the temperature, but we also changed the amount of sugar and the amount of water in this. So can we say for sure that it is the temperature that's causing the sugar to dissolve faster? No, we can't. So this does not support our hypothesis, or maybe it does, but we don't have the right evidence to support that. So we do, we ask ourselves, what could affect the dissolving? Well, we identified three things. We involved, decided the, the water temperature could, the amount of sugar could, and the amount of water could. Those things, those things that could affect the dissolving, the things that we could change in this situation, those are things we refer to as variables. So by definition, a variable is a quantity that is measured or changed in an experiment or observation, or that could be changed, okay? So in this particular experiment, possible variables we have are water temperature, amount of sugar, amount of water. We could even maybe change the shape of the glass, and that would be another possible variable. So we don't know if our hypothesis is correct from that original experiment because more than one variable changed at the same time. In a good experiment, we want to only change one thing at a time. So in this particular uh, experiment, we want to know if, it's, if the temperature of the water affects the speed of dissolving. So that's the one thing I'm going to change. The other things I want to keep the same, the amount of sugar and the amount of water. So in this new experiment, we now have five grams of sugar in each cup, 100 milliliters of water in each cup, and then we can change the temperature. Those things that we keep the same, the variables that we make sure we do not change, are called the control variables. They do not change. The other experimental variable that we have 
is the water temperature, and it is the thing that changes. We refer to it as the experimental variable, or sometimes it's called the independent variable. So now we have some results from a new experiment. Here's some new times to dissolve. And now the question is, does this support our hypothesis? When you know, come back to the video. Well, in this pick case, trial B is the warmest. Trial A is the coolest. Everything else is controlled. And so we're going to go ahead and we are going to say, let's see, 45 is 32 seconds, 35 is 44 seconds, 25 is 53 seconds. Yes, now we can see that a higher temperature makes things dissolve faster. I think sugar dissolves faster in hot water. We now have evidence to support that claim. All right, so our experimental and control variables, um, we can now go ahead and create some definitions for them. So the independent variable is, this, is the single variable that is changed to test its effect. So in other words, it's the thing that I, the scientist, change. And so I always remember the independent variable is the thing that I change, okay? The dependent variable is the variable that changes because of the independent variable, okay? So in this particular case, we had, the thing that we were changing is we changed the temperature of the water in our cup. And what we were expecting to change because of that was the speed or the time to dissolve. So there's our independent variable. Okay. Last but not least, we have our control variables. Those are the things that are kept constant. And that is the amount of sugar and the amount of water. So a few other things we want to take into account when we are using experiments to test our claims, in addition to knowing what our variables are and figuring out whether the results of our, with our dependent variables support our claim, is we also need to think about a few other things. One, we need to think about whether our results are repeatable. Because if I can get repeatable results, in other words, if I can redo the experiment and get the same results, we know that that makes my conclusions more reliable. So if I had multiple different people in different parts of the world do the experiment that we had talked about earlier with the sugar and the different temperatures of water, and everybody got the same results, that tells us that our conclusion that sugar dissolves faster in hotter water is more reliable. The more data we have, the more reliable it is. Secondly, second thing we want to pay attention to is the range of data. We want to collect data over as wide a range as possible. So in that particular thing, uh, in this particular experiment, we had three temperatures. We had 25, 35, and 45 degrees Celsius, right? Is that a very wide range? Well, no, it's really only about 20 degrees, and we could create a much wider range. If you think about us using water, what is the coldest temperature we could possibly use? Well, coldest temperature would be the water until it gets frozen, which happens at zero degrees Celsius. What's the hottest we could do? Well, until it boils away, which would be at 100 degrees Celsius. So if I wanted to test, if I was going to test this experiment or do this experiment with as wide a range of data as possible, I would have had water all the way from zero degrees Celsius all the way up to 100 degrees Celsius at different amounts. Third thing we want to consider about experiments is how we are measuring. Okay, we want to measure as accurately as we need to in order to evaluate our claim or hypothesis. So that might involve us getting a better tool or sometimes using a worse tool to be faster um, so that we can get the data that we need. Right? So if we're measuring to the maximum capability of the tool, we only want to measure as accurately as we need to in order to be able to evaluate our claim or hypothesis. We don't want to overmeasure. We don't want to undermeasure. Okay. Last but not least, integrity. When scientists do their experiment, one thing we count on them for is integrity. We expect them to evaluate their data, but we we it is a common norm in the scientific uh, uh, world that we do not change data. Sometimes scientists get so in love with an idea that they want the data to match their claims so badly that sometimes scientists have, in, have uh, engaged in unethical conduct where they've changed their data. In experiments, we want to make sure that scientists have integrity and that they're not changing their data. Usually that is caught when they um, publish their papers and other people try to repeat it 
and can't come up with the same results. So finally, when we are evaluating claims, we need to do two things. If a scientist find, finds evidence that contradicts a hypothesis, a claim, a law, or a principle that they have, then that hypothesis, law, claim, or principle must be changed. Okay? This is what we talk about when we talk about objectivity. Scientists must accept their findings even when they would like them to be different. They must distinguish between what they see and what they wish to see. All right, so that is a summary of ideas about experimental design and how we test claims. Hopefully between yesterday's Pogel and these notes, you have a much better idea. The second thing we'd like to do today is just simply go through some equipment. In Schoology, once again, you will find a handout, a PDF that has this equipment, looks like that, on it. Um, and we're going to have you go ahead and load that into Notability as well. This year, as we work in chemistry, we will encounter different uh, types of, chemi uh, of equipment. And it's important for you to know or at least be able to reference what that different kind of equipment is. All right, so for uh, a lab, we're going to just kind of go through these all, and you can copy them down on your item as well. Um, these, you might recognize, are called test tubes. Next, we have a flask. It's a spe specific type of flask. It's called an Erlenmeyer flask. Next, we have this piece of glassware. It is called a beaker. Everybody should know what those are. Keeping us safe, those are goggles. Below that, we have this tool. It's used for measuring things out and transferring chemicals. It is called a scoopula because it's a mixture between a scoop and a spatula. This lovely thing, you put stuff in the top and it rolls through. This is referred to as a funnel. These allow you to put a test tube in there and carry it around. This is referred to as a test tube holder. This lovely dish is used for heating up and getting rid of liquids. This is called an evaporating dish. This is a tool that we use primarily for measuring uh, liquids. We did use this, uh, we'll be using this this week in our measuring lab. This is referred to as a graduated cylinder. In this tool, we have water inside and we can use it to squirt the water out to clean or move chemicals down into solutions, etc. This is referred to as a rinse bottle. This interesting tool, you put liquid in it, and then you turn this knob, and when you turn it so that it lines up, the liquid starts coming out the bottom. And it's got markings on the side of it, so you can measure how much liquid goes through. This is referred to as a burette. This is another tool for measuring things out. Can you put a liquid inside here? You put a bulb on the top that caps the, to suck stuff up inside. And then when you push the bulb again, the liquid comes out the bottom. This is referred to as a pipette. On the bottom of the sheet, we have a few more pieces of equipment. This produces a flame that we use to heat stuff up. It is known 
as a Bunsen burner. This might look a little confusing. If I color it in a little bit, you might, under, you might be able to tell what it is some more. We use this to measure the temperature of things. It is a thermometer. This tool allows you to put test tubes in it, multiple test tubes. This is referred to as a test tube rack. This holds those burettes. So you might remember that burette tool from that we had up on the top with the stopcock on the side of it, right? This holds those up. This is a burette clamp. Okay. This, you put a, beer, a pipette in. This is, and then you can wheel it so the liquid comes up or wheel it, push down on the other way so the liquid goes down. This is called a pipette bulb. This is a small plate that's got little cylinder holes in it that you can go ahead and you can put single little drops of chemicals in to mix them together. This is referred to as a spot plate. This sits on a stand, and sometimes you put a wire mesh across the top of it, and you put a beaker up here, etc., cetera, um, to heat things up. This is known as a ring. Okay. This tool is used for measuring the mass of things. This is a balance. And last but not, oh, sorry, we got one more over there on the other side. We've got this one here. This is used for mixing things. It's called a stir rod. It's usually glass. And last but not least, oh, two more actually. This ring, as I said, sits on this stand so you can clamp it on here and put that ring there. This is known as a ring stand. And last thing up here, this is used when you have to clean out a test tube. This is a test tube brush. All right, I think that's all of them. Yep, we've got them all. Okay, so for to finish today's lesson, again, what you should have done is you should have taken notes on our experimental design stuff. You should have recorded your equipment to understand what that is. To check your learning for today's stuff, uh, we have a quiz in Schoology. You get unlimited attempts to get your best score. It will go into the practice category at 20%. Go ahead and complete your quiz, and then that's it for today. Thanks.